Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Lee. And I've got a main connection for today. Um, for those of you who are new to these webinars, um, if you have anything you'd like to say, just put it on, in the chat, which is a button right here. Just type in any questions that you have throughout, and I'm going to answer them all at the end. Uh, for those of you who have been to these webinars, thank you so much for coming. This is my a monthly webinar series that has been going on for all of 2017, and I've had so much fun doing it, and I've had fun because you guys take the time to come out. So thank you so much for coming to the webinars and or watching the recording afterwards. I really appreciate it. I will be continuing these in 2018, possibly not monthly. Um, I'm thinking closer to every six to eight weeks. So I have a better chance to promote them, but they will be going on. So um, check out my newsletter for uh, registration so you can sign up. So let's dive in. What we're going to be looking at today is one of my favorite topics. Um, how the gut, how our gut bacteria affects our overall body is a big passion of mine. And today we're looking at how does the gut affect the immune system. So we're going to be looking at the immune system, uh, but also where this interaction happens how it can break down. So what are the symptoms? First of all, what are the symptoms when it breaks down, but also what is actually happening when those symptoms are happening? Um, and we're going to be looking at your own gut bacteria balance. I'm going to take you through a visualization so you can see possibly what your gut, gut bacteria is doing. And then as always, I will be um, giving you, uh, spending a good half of this time talking about how to find balance. And I will answer all Three of your questions at the end. So as you think of them, please type them in and I will make sure that they get answered. Yay! I also have a little bit of adorableness sitting beside me. I'm just going to grab her. This is my new kitten, Aya. She likes to join webinars. Usually she hangs out behind my laptop. But just in case you have to see this black little tail walk by, that's, that's her. Um, so for those of you who are new to the world of um, Lisa Kilgore, I am a registered holistic nutritionist, and I've been so since 2007. And in those 10 years, I've worked with thousands and thousands of clients with a variety of health issues. I do specialize in complex digestive issues, as well as how our gut bacteria interacts with our body, but I work with everything. Um, I also personally lived on sugar and processed food for a long time uh, until I had to. Uh, my diet was atrocious and I changed because my health was a disaster. Uh, and so basically, no matter where you're starting, I've probably started somewhere kind of worse. Um, and I personally dealt with a lot of chronic inflammation, unsurprisingly, uh, that was related to my gut bacteria. Um, I was a music student, um, a performance music student, playing the flute, and I had uncontrolled asthma. I had nerve damage down both my, in both my arms and tendonitis in both my thumbs, making uh, it really, really difficult to play. Um, I just heard my video is frozen, so I'm going to, again, it froze the last time. I'm changing um, companies uh, for the next year, so we shouldn't have this. Um, I just restarted my video, so Kim, can you just let me know if that makes it better? Oh, good. Yay. So just let me know if you see things, weird things like that. Um, this company has been good most of the year, last couple have been a little, we've had a few little technical glitches, um, so just let me know if that continues. Um, so back to my chronic inflammatory issues, um, I had um, spent my high school life and half of my university life on antibiotics for chronic strep throat. So by the end of my schooling, I had all of these inflammatory conditions that were so related to my gut bacteria, and I know that because when I fixed my gut bacteria, they all went away. Um, and so I have dealt with this myself. And so that's why we're going to be looking at this topic. So let's start with the immune system. And I like to start here with this topic um, because if you're dealing with any autoimmune conditions, especially and chronic in, uh, infl inflammation, especially the big diseases that come out of chronic inflammation, like heart disease, diabetes, even depression can be chronic, inflama chronic uh, inflammation issue. It can be hard to love your immune system. Um, and so at, as, as a general rule, a good, happy, and balanced immune system has two giant major jobs. The first one is healing. 
So if I were to um, get a scratch or cut on my arm, my immune system would send inflammation to that area. And in that inflammation would be white blood cells and nutrients and platelets and all of the factors needed to heal that, spot, that wound. And over the course of maybe days or weeks or months, depending on how big of a wound that was, it will heal completely. Like I'm completely covered in kitten scratches and within a few, within a week they'll be gone and I won't be able to see them. And that's unbelievably miraculous. Um, when it goes awry is when that inflammation doesn't go away. So if, if say I, I bang my elbow and yeah, the inflammation was important at the beginning, um, it's later when it still hurts and it's still causing a problem, that's a sign that my body isn't balanced, my immune system isn't able to sweep that inflammation away. The other job it does is scavenge and scours the body looking for rogue cells, cells that shouldn't be there. That could be viruses or bacteria, that could be um, uh, cells that shouldn't be there, like a lung cell on your liver. And um, a lot of cancers start that way. They're just the wrong cell in the wrong place. And your immune system does a brilliant job at finding them. And when your immune system is happy and healthy, it, is, it has the time and energy to do this, this scavenging. So what you're gonna be looking at when, when our immune system doesn't work properly are issues in those two areas, either in inflammation or with the judgment of cells, whether or not your immune system can tell the difference between a rogue cell and a, a good cell where it should be and everything's happy. So that's really where things can break down the most. And one thing that we don't usually expect or think about is how much of our immune system is living around our gut. 80% of our immune system lives around our gut. And the reason it lives there, it hangs out there, is because uh, your small intestinal tract is where nutrients and vitamins and minerals and uh, carbs, fats, and proteins are all absorbed. The inside of your small intestine is considered outside of the body, and on the other side, where your immune system and your bloodstream is, is inside the body. This is where a lot of stuff is going to go through. So this is where your immune system is constantly watching to make sure that, the, that viruses and bacteria and things that shouldn't be there don't get through that, that uh, intestinal wall. And so your immune system is there, and it's happy, and it loves being there. And it has developed, our immune system developed with the bacteria in our gut. The bacteria came first. Um, as beings evolved, um, we had bacteria in our system before we had what we could call, call a recognizable immune system. So immune systems always had this bacteria there. And they interact, and they have an amazing interaction. Our gut bacteria is there to keep us alive. And the main reason that it's there to keep us alive is because it's our, it's, we're its home. When our gut bacteria, um, when we die or we have an illness or a problem, our gut bacteria suffers. So our gut bacteria is really working hard to make sure that we stay healthy. And its interaction with our immune system is part of that. So what our, what our gut bacteria does is it uses tools to keep their environment happy and healthy and therefore keeps us happy and healthy. And what our gut bacteria are, are modulators. They literally tell the immune system when to react and when not to react. So these creatures that are not human, that are not ourselves, are actually the um, conductor of our immune system. And the reason for that is that our um, immune system would attack them and kill them all off. Um, if there wasn't this role. So that's why our gut bacteria as a survival uh, mechanism worked on making sure that the immune system stays modulated. So it's our immune system, it's our gut bacteria that takes an immune system that's overwhelmed and pulls it down. It's our gut bacteria that partially takes a lower, lower immune system and brings it up. Generally though, it's pulling it down. And research has found that um, when an animal, they haven't done human studies on this yet that I've seen, um, but when an animal is, is um, birthed by C-section and has no bacteria, their immune system is overwhelmed and they have lots of symptoms of that. And we're going to look at what those are in a few slides. 
when the bacteria comes in, the immune system comes right down. So there is a, a significant modulation um, that's happening from our gut bacteria to our immune system. So let's look at the research. I, I have two studies I want to tell you about. Well, two, one anecdote and one study um, that's looking at how our gut bacteria affects our immune system. And the first place we're going to start is the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a giant change of life for human beings. Um, the people who lived in the country are moving into the cities to work in these factories. And life is very hard. Uh, the cities don't have sanitation. There's no sewage. The water is dirty. Can you imagine living in a city even with 100,000 people with no proper sanitation? Um, you can just imagine how filthy cities were. And um, the hours were long and life was just really hard, except they weren't hard, difficult for the upper classes. The upper classes, um, the upper, upper class, they made all the money off the Industrial Revolution. So their life really got better. Um, these factories made them tons and tons of money and that created a lot of innovation. So the upper, upper classes, they had cleaner water. They had what was closer to sanitation. And they also developed a very interesting symptom. They developed hay fever. Hay fever first came about during the Industrial Revolution and only in the upper classes. And it was so unique to that group of people that um, it became posh to be sneezing every spring. And now we, of course, all, um, ha deal, many of us, most of us deal with some form of allergies at some point in the year. And this is because all of our lives are much cleaner. When it comes to allergies, it's an immune system that's just a little bit overactive. It's just a little bit overwhelmed. It's just a tad up. And it is confusing pollen and dander um, and all of those airborne allergens as viruses and bacteria. They look similar, but they don't look the same. And so a balanced immune system can tell the difference. An out of balance immune system um, gets confused. And that's why some days are, or some years our allergies are worse than others. Sometimes that's the pollen count. Sometimes that, uh, that's our gut bacteria. So just keep that in mind. This, this in, in, incredibly interesting um, connection between a cleaner life and allergies. The next study, this is a proper study that looked at a group of people that live near the Finland and Russian border. And this was, these are two different towns. They're about a hundred miles apart and um, they're very genetically similar. They're, they're in fairly remote area. And um, until maybe a hundred years ago, they were of the same country even. That border came down um, fairly recently in, in terms of history. And so they're a really good um, group to study because here are two groups of people living very differently but with very similar genetic makeup. So we can um, assume that any differences between their health doesn't have anything to do with their genes. Um, it has something to do with some other input. And what they looked at specifically was type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, or what was called childhood onset um, diabetes, and this is an autoimmune condition where the um, immune system attacks the pancreas and kills off the beta cells, which produce insulin. And this is um, generally a, a condition that comes in childhood and um, is really affects your life. It was the death sentence before Bantam created or discovered insulin. Um, now it is a manageable condition, but it is a, man it's a condition that you're managing six, seven, eight times a day. Um, so it's a difficult one. The interesting thing that I didn't realize before I read this study is that the, the rates of type one diabetes are increasing quite dramatically from each generation. So um, this current generation has a much higher risk of type 1 diabetes than they did when, in my, my generation um, when I was a kid. And what was interesting here is in Finland, they had four times the rate of type 1 diabetes versus Russia. So the, here we have two groups of people that are genetically similar and there's four times more diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes in Finland. And the difference between these two groups of people was this, the cleanliness of their life. In Russia, 
they had um, multiple strains of bacteria in their water, and many of the children developed um, uh, conditions that are connected to fecal contamination. So they were dealing with gut bacteria imbalances that come from being in close proximity to feces. So basically bad sanitation. In Finland, they're living like we do here in Canada. Their water is clean, their sanitation is fantastic, but they have four times the high, higher risk of type one diabetes. So this is, yes, one study, uh, but it is really highlighting um, what happens when we don't have this input of bacteria in our system and how it can create an imbalance in our immune system and create something as, as difficult as type 1 diabetes. So now let's take a look at how, what happens when this system breaks down. And first, let's look at the symptoms. So when your immune system is out of balance and overwhelmed, so this is when it's sitting too high, which is the most common place for your immune system to be, um, the first symptom of that are seasonal allergies and asthma. Um, babies born by C-section who don't get inoculated with the proper bacteria have a significantly higher rate of allergies and asthma by the time they're 10 years old. So there's this is just an early sign, but a sign that things are just up a bit too high. Your immune system is seeing those pollen and danders as, as invaders when they actually aren't. The next stage um, is noticeable inflammation. So this is inflammation. Um, this is chronic inflammation. What I talked about a few slides ago at the beginning was acute inflammation. When we have it in injury and inflammation goes to heal it. Chronic inflammation is significantly more insidious and can actually break down those joints. So we want to um, stop that inflammation when it becomes chronic. So chronic inflammation is just a sign that your immune system is unable to pull it down, that, you're, that your um, inflammation is staying high. And the last symptom or the next stage um, after chronic inflammation is autoimmune conditions or chronic diseases that are coming out of inflammation. So with autoimmune conditions like type 1 diabetes, but this could be Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it could be rheumatoid arthritis, there are so many different kinds of autoimmune conditions. They all have one similar factor, and that is your immune system is attacking your own cells. So instead of it's going around and finding rogue cells that shouldn't be there, it's overwhelmed and unable to tell the difference between a good cell that's supposed to be there that's yours and a rogue cell that either is in the wrong place or is a virus or bacteria or something that shouldn't be there. And that is what makes autoimmune conditions so difficult is that um, they, they have this core root problem of an immune system that is um, attacking the body, but they attack in different places. So the main, main treatment for autoimmune conditions is um, to ta take something to depress the immune system that does work. Uh, I work with a lot of people with inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and colitis, which is also an autoimmune condition, and there's absolute time and a place for that, that medication. We also can use our gut bacteria to create its own modulation. So it all depends on where you are in your condition, um, whether or not that you can just do the natural route or if you need the medications as well. And as a nutritionist, I am not the person to ask of whether or not it, this is the time or the place. That is a conversation to have with your doctor. What I can say in my experience is that me those medications can be incredibly helpful um, depending on where you're at. So don't... Um, negate them just because their medications um, really do have a good conversation with your doctor um, to see what will work best for you. So the first way that it breaks down is when our gut bacteria is off. So when our gut bacteria is beautiful and happy and balanced and full of diversity and with big, big numbers, then our immune system stays balanced. What this bacteria, oh, the video is frozen again. Let me uh, fix that. Thank you, Rosa. Um, I hope that's better, so just let me know if it, um, that changes. So when your um, immune system is um, happy and balanced because your gut bacteria is happy and balanced, it creates these very immune cells called regulatory T cells. Regulatory T cells do what their name sounds. They literally regulate the uh, immune system. And when your immune system, it has a lot of these T cells, your risk of chronic inflammation and autoimmune conditions is a lot lower. So they have connected these reg regulatory T cells, um, lower levels with autoimmune conditions. 
So um, when our gut bacteria though is poor and unbalanced, and what that means is we have low numbers of bacteria or we have low diversity of gut bacteria. That leads to a much lower numbers of these regulatory T cells and higher rates of autoimmune conditions, allergies, and other metabolic disorders like um, just obesity is connected to with this. So what we want to do is create diversity as a method to balance your immune system. So Kim just mentioned that my video is freezing when I change slides. So just let me know if it's continuing to freeze even after the slide has changed. And thanks, guys, for letting me know. The other way it's, it breaks down is in a condition called leaky gut. Um, leaky gut is an, an issue in your small intestinal tract, and that's what the cells are that you can see right now. Um, your small intestinal tract is one single cell layer thick and has this beautiful, gigantic surface area. And um, when our, what, what we should have are these tight junctions between those cells, and those tight junctions allow only fully digested food and vitamins and minerals and nutrients. But when there's damage, and we're going to talk about how that happens in a second, we can get gaps. And in these gaps, undigested protein gets through. And the undigested protein looks just like a virus or a bacteria to your immune system. Your immune system creates an antibody. That antibody is testable. And every single time you eat that food, your immune system says, oh my gosh, this bacteria is back or this virus is back. I need to attack it. Because there isn't, it's impossible for your immune system to distinguish between a undigested protein and a virus or a bacteria. You can test for these um, food allergies or these food sensitivities. You can do that through me, you can do that through a natural path, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So let's take a look at your inner ecosystem. How is your gut bacteria doing? And what we're going to be looking at in particular is your small intestinal tract, the place that this is all happening, this um, uh, tight junction versus leakiness is happening. And what I want you to do is picture your small intestinal tract fully stretched out and laid out um, completely flat. And your small intestinal tract has a gigantic surface area and it gets it from all of the, these little fingers called villi on the cells. So when, when it's stretched flat, it's the size of a small tennis court. So picture that amount of space. So um, a small tennis court sized area. And I want you to picture it fully covered with the most beautiful, glorious grass you have ever seen. And the grass in this analogy is our, is our gut bacteria. On top of our small intestinal wall, which is only one single cell layer, so we have one cell of, of human cells, we have one single cell layer of bacteria on top of it. Like grass, they're side by side and rooted and attached to the small intestinal wall. And this protects that single cell layer. We've now doubled the amount of um, distance between the food in your small intestine and, your, and, and the inside of you. So it's a very important layer of bacteria. It's an incredibly protective layer of bacteria. It helps heal any leakiness in your gut. It um, makes sure that food is digested properly. This, this bacteria creates enzymes and it protects our body from weeds. So imagine um, some seeds from a weed flying through the air and landing on your gorgeous green lawn. What happens? Nothing much. There isn't space. You, it's, there isn't space for that weed to take over and grow and just take over all the grass. The same thing happens in our gut. When um, salmonella, E. coli, or even C. difficile comes into our gut, when we have a strong and healthy ecosystem, nothing happens. Um, they just work all their way through. But when we have space, then they, they grow. This is why taking a probiotic in hospital may reduce the risk of C. difficile. Um, that, that's why when two people or a group of people eat exactly the same food, some get sick and some don't. Um, this is all due to your own ecosystem. But what happens if your grass gets pulled out? This barren wasteland um, happens the second time you take antibiotics at some point in your life if you don't fix your gut bacteria in between. Um, and what happens here is that your small intestinal wall is no longer protected. You no longer have that protection layer. And this is where leakiness and leaky gut can come from. 
There isn't the bacteria to modulate your immune system, so it creates an imbalance. And eventually, weeds come in um, and can completely take over. And so this is where parasites and yeast and bad bacteria can come in. Um, this is where those food allergy, or sorry, those um, uh, food poison ish, um, uh, bacteria can come in and take and make a huge mess of it. Um, and so what we need to do is, is go back to this beautiful green lawn and create this balance again. And that's what we're going to be talking about next, is how to create that balance. And the good news is, is that it's actually fairly easy and it's completely in your, your hands because your gut bacteria is 100% fed on your diet. And we can make measurable changes in your gut bacteria in seven days. Um, it's been well studied. Small changes work. You don't need to go on like a dramatic gut bacteria cleanse or a candida cleanse to fix things. We actually can add food to our diet that fixes it and squish out the other guys. There is a time where doing a gut bacteria cleanse um, is beneficial, uh, but it's not necessarily what everybody has to do and nor does it have to last months. Um, I usually do it for two to four weeks with my clients. Um, and that there's a time and a place for that. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. So the first thing we want to do is seed our gut. So what we want to do is bring in the equivalent of what good grass seed would be in your lawn. And that is a good probiotic supplement. Because when we don't have enough seeds, we get low diversity. And when we have low diversity, we have a higher risk of autoimmune conditions and allergies like we've talked about. We also have a higher risk of depression and anxiety. And preliminary research has found that two weeks on a probiotic supplement can reduce anxiety symptoms. More research is needed, but it's starting, as well as obesity. So there's a lot that can happen um, when we don't have enough diversity in our gut. So when you're looking for a probiotic supplement, you want to look for a human strain, multi-strain probiotic, or simply one that works for your gut. If you have any digestive symptoms and you've been taking a probiotic for two, four weeks, um, and you haven't noticed any change whatsoever, find a new one. Um, your diversity, your gut bacteria, your ecosystem is unique to everybody else's. So you can't expect the perfect uh, probiotic for me to be the perfect probiotic for you. Generally, when you start with a good quality human strain, multi-strain probiotic, um, you'll, you'll, most, uh, those are the ones that more people get results from, but you want one that works for you. If you have absolutely no symptoms and no digestive symptoms, your gut bacteria is beautiful, um, you haven't had antibiotics in a long time, and any result of like any issue with those antibiotics have been dealt with, great. You still need a probiotic, you just don't necessarily need it every day. So what we need a probiotic for in that uh, moment when our gut is really happy is to um, create what we would have gotten in our water and in our soil and, and in our life before soap and clean water and sanitation. It's this input of bacteria semi-regularly. So once a week or a few times a week is still really beneficial even when you don't um, have any digestive symptoms. What we need to do every day is these next two steps. And one of them is lots and lots of plant-based food and in a lots and lots of variety. And so first, the first step is to bring in lots of fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole grains, beans. All of these contain fibers that feed our gut bacteria. The second step is to increase the variety in those foods because we all tend to get into habits. I'm, I am a creature of habit. I tend to buy the same fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds every week. And what I try to do is either once a month or for a month, I, I start buying different things to work in a, a bit of a variety. Because what the American Gut Project has found, and this is a crowdsourced gut bacteria project, basically it's they collect people's poop and test it. They um, have found a, they can actually determine somebody and be a variety of plant-based foods in somebody's diet simply by looking at the strains of bacteria and the diversity in their gut bacteria. So this really works. So it's just making sure you're getting lots of plant-based foods with lots of, lots of fiber um, every day, and that can create a lot of balance. The opposite is how we normally eat in North America, which is low fiber foods and the same foods over and over and over again. Without fiber, we don't get the bacteria, that, um, we don't get to feed the bacteria in our gut. So we, that's where, why we want that fiber. Um, and the best is to come from fruits and vegetables. 
fermented foods also play a significant role in our gut bacteria. So what fermented foods and having a fermented food every day does, is it provides some seeds, not enough to replace the probiotic, but they're still important seeds. But what they do more than anything else is they create this environment. They create the environment that good bacteria wants to live in and they feed them. It's like miracle growth for your gut bacteria. All you need is one serving a day. And so that could be like a few tablespoons of sauerkraut or kimchi or a, a properly made veal pickle. Could be a quarter to a half a cup of yogurt, kefir, or a few slices of raw milk cheese. Um, kefir research has found is one of the best for your gut if you digest dairy okay. Um, a cup of uh, kombucha, a few tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, um, some miso, tempeh, or nachos, some fermented soy, a bit of sourdough bread, um, a bit of wine and beer. They can feed other stuff too, so watch that amount. Um, and you just need one serving of one of these. You don't need all of them. Um, I did find though that once I started, I had trouble stopping and my, my body enjoyed um, more and more and more. And so if you look in my fridge, you'll find some sourdough bread. Um, you'll usually find some wine on my counter. Um, you'll find some tempeh in my freezer, frequently in my fridge if that's what I'm eating. Um, and sour, some sauerkraut and some kimchi in my fridge as well. Um, I don't do dairy very well, so I don't have a lot of the fermented dairy. Um, just one serving every day and it really helps the gut more than anything else. And lastly, you want to heal the gut. So this is if you are dealing with any leaky gut symptoms, um, chronic inflammation, autoimmune conditions, uh, allergies will we'll usually have both the gut bacteria imbalance and a leaky gut issue. So this is healing that intestinal wall. Um, that single cell layer gets damaged really easily, but it heals really easily as well. So it's this nice balance. Um, and one of the ways to um, heal, literally heal that intestinal wall is using homemade bone stock. Um, I have a recipe on my, my blog if you are looking to make some. It can be any bones, chicken, fish, or beef. Um, you just want a long simmer and a splash of vinegar. But if you're a vegetarian or you uh, struggle with making bone stock or you don't want the smell in your house, because I hear you on all of those, um, then aloe vera juice does a really great job. Um, bone stock comes with minerals as well, but aloe vera does do a great job at healing the intestinal wall. You need about four to eight ounces a day of the aloe vera juice. Cooked veggies are easier on your gut than raw, so if you're dealing with and you're trying to heal your gut, eating more cooked veggies versus raw, getting a serving of fermented foods every day, and then consider um, finding your food allergy. What are those foods that your immune system is reacting to? And pulling them out of your diet for two to three months um, to let your gut heal can really make a big difference. Um, sometimes it can be much more complex than that. Um, so an elimination diet, so, so like if you are dealing with a lot of conditions, it might not be as simple as, oh, you have a gluten sensitivity, take that out for three months. I wish it was that easy. Sometimes it is large lists with complex foods, um, and I can help you through that, but it is, it can be difficult. Um, an elimination diet is a simple version of that, but basically you take the um, biggest allergies, and there's five. It's gluten, dairy, soy, eggs, and corn are the five. And you take those out of your diet for two to three weeks, and then you try each food one at a time and see what your reaction is. And it might be an inflammatory reaction, um, or it might be a gut reaction. And you try each food once a week. So on, say you choose Saturdays, every Saturday you try food, and then you go back on the elimination diet to clear that out of your system. Um, the other method is the IgG food sensitivity testing. And you can do that through me, or you can do that through a naturopath. Uh, through me, um, it's my, the company I use um, tests 200 different foods, and you get a list of all of the foods that your body ha has created an uh, IgG antibody to, and that's the type of antibody that creates chronic inflammation usually. Um, warning, it can be an overwhelming list, um, and I can help talk you through it um, on wh where to, what to pay the most attention to, but just be aware that the elimination diet can be difficult, the food allergy testing um, just simply can be overwhelming, uh, but can provide really, really great information. So just send me an email if you're um, interested in either of those.
And that's everything. So that is, I'm going to open up the floor for questions. So please feel free to type them in um, if you have any questions whatsoever or if you want to discuss anything that we've talked about. And I just wanted to let you know that I will be continuing um, this these webinar series next year. Um, I'm gonna start with five reasons we crave sugar, which was September's webinar of this year. And the reason is it was really popular and I had and it was full of technical problems. Um, all the way down to the, the first webinar I couldn't get into and it wouldn't work. And the second one, I forgot to hit record. And then what my attempt to re-record it, I forgot to hit, turn on my audio. So um, this one deserves a repeat. Um, and so it will be either late January or early February. So stay tuned for the registration for that. I will be um, changing the company that I use uh, for the webinar. And that's why I don't have a link yet, because I haven't fully decided which one to do. Um, and if you have any ideas or suggestions for topics for 2018, please don't hesitate to email me. I would love to hear them. I'm creating my plan for 2018 over Christmas, over the holidays. And um, I would really appreciate um, hearing what you would like to know. And I just might exa make exactly that. So I see uh, uh, the first question coming in. Please keep typing in your questions as we go. And the first one is from Kim. Do you recommend a particular brand of aloe vera juice? It's a great question, Kim. So there are two brands. So let me step, take one step back. The first thing you want is a pure aloe vera juice. You don't want an aloe vera juice that has sugar. Like there's a lot of watered down aloe vera juices that are trying to make them taste better. Aloe is not that terrible. Um, so you don't need to make it taste better. So um, that's the first step. So there's two companies that make a pure aloe vera juice. The first one is a lily of the desert and um, it comes in a brown glass bottle and the other is George's which comes in a almost clear white plastic bottle. The difference between the two is um, lily of the desert tastes like aloe which is a slight bitterness that some people love and some people hate um, and George's tastes like water. Um, it's been distilled so there's no flavor whatsoever. Generally, I recommend going with Lily of the Desert um, to start with because um, if you, what I like about things that taste like what they are um, is that you can crave it when you need it. So when I have an overwhelming urge to drink some aloe vera juice, um, it's usually because I need it because it's not that great, but it's not terrible. Um, George's won't give you that flavor trigger, um, but there, but it is also healing. So if you, if you struggle with flavor or you have a child or a teenager or a 20 something that you don't know if they'll take something that doesn't taste good, it really tastes like, tastes like water. Um, but, but go with either. They both work really well. With Lily of the Desert, there is whole leaf aloe vera juice and inner leaf aloe vera juice. They both will do the same healing. Um, the whole leaf will be a laxative if you drink a lot of it and the inner leaf won't do that. So the, the, um, if you want it also to be a laxative, go with the whole leaf. Um, but if you don't care and you're only taking four to eight ounces a day, you don't, it doesn't really matter. Stay away from the aloe vera gel. It does work better, but it has a, a really weird and um, not great um, preservative in it. So until they fix that, stay away from the gel. Um, I did see another question starting to type, but I don't see it coming in yet. Um, so, oh, there's, there it is. Um, there we go. Uh, so Kim says, I had an extreme number of antibiotics as a child. Is it possible to change to, for the gut bacteria to permanently change? It's a really good question, Kim. Um, I had a, uh, I also had um, imbalances as a kid. I had some antibiotics and I was bottle fed, not breastfed, which creates different gut bacteria balance. And if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have said, you can change it, but you have to work at it. Um, and I still work at mine a bit, but it's becoming more stable. So um, yes, you can change it, but I would um, give yourself some patience. And at first you might need something on hand. So what I had for the first few years is I regularly took um, oregano oil to change, get my gut bacteria de-weeded. I had an overgrowth of candida and so I used it fairly regularly to de-weed. Today we have a better option. Um, there's, uh, Botanica has created a fermented oregano 
which is a gentle version of oregano, um, and it only kills off bad guys, it leaves the good guys. So you can actually do that longer term. Um, oregano oil kills off everything, so you start, you're basically creating a desert every time. So I was just constantly trying to create a better ecosystem and then killing it all off. So using the fermented oregano by Botanica is much better at creating that balance. Bringing in the fermented foods, I found, speeded up the process enormously um, and and you'll need to heal your gut semi-regularly as well when we're creating this balance so um, when it's been a long time Kim it will take a while um, give yourself some time like I'm 10 years in at least um, closer to 15 um, I'm 15 years in and 10 years of actually like knowing what was going on instead of just like trying things out um, and I, I am doing a lot better um, and I know that your gut can get more imbalanced as well. It's just got to take some patience. The issue is when you're a kid is when your body thinks this is the perfect balance. So at first, your gut bacteria keeps trying to go back to that balance you had as a child. And that's where, that's why it takes so long. Um, Julie asks, um, what about ingesting borax for an autoimmune disorder? To be completely honest, I have never seen that before, so I don't know. Um, I, and it's either a new thing or something that's, that's um, in circles that I haven't been in before. So I don't have an opinion either way, other than, I don't know if I don't want to take some borax, but I, I can't give you any opinion whatsoever. Um, uh, many natural paths um, are using low-dose naltrexone uh, for autoimmune conditions with great results. So that's a, a very gentle way of pulling the immune system down. Um, and so that's the kind, that's what I'm hearing more than anything. Um, without a prescription, I haven't heard of anything that would pull the immune system down other than balancing out your gut bacteria. So Julie, I'm sorry, I don't have any answer for the, for the borax. I don't see any, any other typing. Um, so I will, um, I'm going to say goodbye now. Um, I'm going to end the recording, but I'll stay on if you have any other questions, especially if you have a question that you don't want um, as public as on the recording. So for those of you who, who came out to the live event, thank you so much for coming. Um, and for those of you watching on the recording, thanks for taking the time to watch the recording. I've really, really appreciated all of the time that you guys have spent with me this year. And I hope to see you out a whole bunch in 2018. Thank you so much. Um, have a happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy solstice. Whatever you celebrate, I hope you enjoy um, the season. Tomorrow is when the light comes back. It's the solstice tomorrow. Um, and so I hope you enjoy this and get some downtime and just have some relaxation. And I will see you bright and early in 2018. Bye-bye.